guys, this is Melorian, and this will be another War Machine 101. So in these videos here, I take my your questions and I do my best to answer them. Uh, where I get these questions from is from the Facebook page. There's a Mr. Melorian Facebook page. Uh, please come in, join, like. I have a lot of stuff on there, and a big part here is that every Thursday or Friday I'll be asking for your questions, and on the weekend I'll be answering them. So here we are. Today we have four questions to answer, and uh, the first one's kind of an interesting one. It comes here from T.C. Srider and says, Drawing the Battle Line Strategy. So what this is all about is that you're going to be deploying. You're going to have one force here, there's going to be another force here, and then you're going to come together. Sometimes, I guess it would be like a straight line in the middle, but those lines there, and how they curve, and how they go, that's the, the drawing the battle lines. And there is a real strategy to that. I mean, in one point, you could say like, oh, you just push your things forward, attack, and what happens is what happens. But that's kind of a lazy strategy. You want to have kind of a more kind of an idea behind it. You want to have an idea that this is where I'm going to be really focusing my energy. In this area, I can hold back. And there can be multiple reasons for that. I mean, this is a very complex question, but uh, a good example of why you're going to be pushing in one area is maybe you're pushing in one area to go after a flag or objective or a zone, right? You're pushing here because you want to be scoring on the objective. Another reason why I'll be pushing here is that I need to be taking out some support pieces. I know that if I can kill these agitators over here, that your Cephalix army is going to fall apart, right? If I'm up against Axis and I can push through here and I can kill these foundries, you're really going to be in a lot of trouble, right? So there's another reason to push like that. Another one could just be going for the caster kill, right? I'm just going to plow through and I'm going to try and get to this caster. Now, why would you be kind of holding back? Well, the reason why you might be holding back in a region is, one, maybe because you just depend on your range. Maybe you're a, a shooty element there, and there's no reason to move up. You want to stay back, and you want to shoot, shoot, shoot. It doesn't mean that you need to hold back everywhere. You know, maybe you have some shooters over here, and while they're shooting, your melee troops are coming forward over here. Uh, another reason why you might have something holding back is maybe you're just outclassed. What you are facing on the other side is just going to tear you apart, and if you run forward, you're just going to get wiped out, and they're going to be able to then charge through that opening that you just made in your battle lines. So you're better off just to hold back and slowly feed things to slow them down, so that other parts of the lines you can then wipe things out on your own and then be able to come back and focus your energies on those were once superior troops now you're able to focus more force on them and wipe them out now like i said there's lots and lots of different situations we can talk about here but probably the best way to explain it is through chess so in chess it's all about peace treating uh, trading <laughs> And it's all about peace treaties. That's what chess is all about. Anyway, um, so you're going to be pushing up your pawns there. And it's all about, okay, you're going to take this very cheap pawn. And then I'm going to take whatever you take out from whatever you use to kill my pawn. And if you come back and kill this guy, I can kill this. And it's just peace trading after peace trading. And at the end, you want to be the guy on top. Where either you might be doing that to be getting the most points out of it or just to hold that objective. Uh, you know, even in chess, holding up board area can be very, very important, and you might give up more points than you take just to hold this part of the board. And that can be the same thing here with War Machine. And the major thing here is you just have to have that plan behind it. You have to realize that, okay, these guys, maybe they're, let's say, the press gangers. The press gangers are your pawns, they're running up, and you're realizing they're just there to hold the board. And you know, for your battle line, this is going to be pushed right up here. But if you just blindly push things up, well, they might just get destroyed. So you have to have a follow-up. Okay, you might kill the press gangers, but then I'm going to be countering with the forge guard. Or, you know, then when you when I counter with the forge guard and you counter with your heavy, hey, then I have my heavy that's going to counter. And you have to really keep that peace trading in mind. So 
Like I said, this is a very, very complex strategy of how you're going to be building the lines, but really probably the biggest thing to keep in mind is, one, you don't need to be a single line running up. You can have a, a big bubble pushing here and this part holding back, or multiple different things. Maybe it's on the flanks you're really pushing hard, but you have to be having a reason behind it, and you should be really thinking about one, those objectives of why you're doing it, and two, think it out as far as the peace trade. How is this battle going to go? If I put this point here, what can take me out? What can I use to counter? So, <laughs> uh, TC Srider, that's a great question. Hopefully I said enough on it, but uh, yes, it's definitely... If you can master that and doing your battle lines, that's a huge part of the game and uh, can be some very high level strategy there. So hopefully I was able to touch on it enough. Uh, next one here is from Martin Shrek, who is also Martha and the Machines. Uh, you gotta make some more videos, buddy. I'm waiting for him. Uh, anyway, he's talking about here, what about block deployment versus line deployment. So uh, just to kind of quickly explain it, when <laughs> when you have your 4x4 board and you have your deployment zone, you have a couple of options. You could line things out all the way across the board or you could block them together and really keep things together. And so his question is here, well, what are the various advantages for both? Well, there, again, there can be multiple, but uh, let's break it down to some very clear and concise ones. First one is scenario. If the scenario is all based off of one zone in the middle of the board, well, you might as well block things up and try and force your way in, right? You don't need to spread out. There's nothing over here on the flanks for you to deal with. However, if it's something more like incursion, where you have scenario objectives all the way across, or flags to be specific, well, you might want to spread out to try and take all of these. Or again, if there's a big zone over here and a big zone over here, you need to spread out in order to hold both. If I was to go and take my block deployment when I have two separate zones I need to go after, that's going to be very difficult to actually pull off. Now, that scenario-wise, it could also be list-wise. So list-wise, if I have a list that has a lot of synergies, and it's all about things having to be within a certain area. So a classic example of this is trolls, where I might have the stone bears who have their aura of giving extra armor. So everyone wants to be inside that bubble. Plus I might have Janissa that puts up a wall. And again, you really need to be really tight in to use those walls. Well, when you have that going for you, it really helps to stay together. You know, you got the fell callers, the one we trying to buff these guys in the front lines, and they want to be somewhere where they'll be protected. That's another big idea, is that if you are going with a block deployment, you're basically building a castle and building yourself a safe zone. Because if you draw things on a line, it's all about line of sight. And you're not really blocking a line of sight when you stretch yourself out. When you bring it together and you turn it into a block, you're usually building a safe area behind. So it's just really, really powerful support pieces that are enticing you to come together anyway will be safer in this block deployment. So that's a really big deal. Of course, then the opposite. If you have a list that has no real synergies, there's no real reason why these guys need to be together and all clumped up, uh, they can just kind of spread out all they want, right? There's no real need to be together. Now, another big idea to keep in mind this is how fast you can get up the board. Clearly, if you are deploying line-wise across the ways, then you are going to get every model at the very farthest up could be, and your army is going to go up the board as fast as possible. So if you're up against a shooty army that you need to engage, you might want to go line-wise so that everything is going up as fast as possible. You know, clearly, if you're going for a block deployment, models are being deployed further and further back, and they just aren't going to get up the board as fast. So again, there's another one. You might be dealing with what's the scenario, you might be dealing with what's your synergies, but we also have to deal with what's actually on the other side of the board uh, and how, effect, how fast do I need to be getting to them. Uh, 
Uh, another one too, just talking about synergies, uh, I guess it's kind of implied, but say like your feats, right? If you have a caster with a very small control area, uh, let's say someone like Lilith, who Lilith has a really good feat. We're not even talking about Lilith 2, we're talking about Lilith 1, who gives you an additional dice to hit. That's awesome, but that only goes out 10 inches. So her army really has to stay together as opposed to someone like Harbinger that goes out 20 inches, you know, nobody needs to be really close for that feat, but then again, if you want to be close for awe or for martyring, they have to stay close for that part. So, you know, again, it's about what part of the, the list that you're trying to really take advantage of. You know, maybe in this case, I feel that Awe is going to be really important, that martyring is going to be very important, so I'm going to go and we're going to go into brick formation, and everything's going to be very close together. And another one, same list, Harbinger, I might say, you know what, I just need to get up the board as fast as I can, I'm playing Incursion now, space out, get up on those lines, and up we go. And I, I think that's a really big thing to keep in mind too, is that a lot of people, when they go and design an army, they will design it with a deployment in mind that this will either be spread out like this in a line deployment or in brick deployment and that's that's nothing wrong that that's good you should have a plan for how your army is going to be deployed but keep in mind that given the scenario you may need to change that again maybe your plan is always to go brick but then all of a sudden you're playing incursion so you need to spread out or you have a lot of guys and you normally have to really spread out, but because of maybe terrain or maybe because of that single scenario, you know, I could deploy guys on the flanks, but they're just not going to do anything. With that again, let's talk about terrain. Terrain could be another reason why this is happening. If I have forests and rough terrain spread around, I don't have Pathfinder, I might be forced to block up. I could be going out on line deployment, but then as I move up, those forces that I have to deal with going through that rough terrain are just going to fall behind. And at the end of the day, is it really worth having them there, or is it better off just to go block, get past that terrain, and then spread out? Again, it depends on what the terrain is, what the scenario is, what your opponent is, what you are. But realize that those things might mean that you need to change your formation for that given battle. So maybe that's a good thing to do when you're actually making out your list. Try and design it about how it would look like if it was as a brick and going out in line deployment. Normally, just to be super honest here, I usually have my one single idea and that's what I really work it out to. And then I'm kind of more flexible with it. But if this is something you're really struggling with and you want to try and see what it looks like, you know, you could draw it out on a piece of paper, you can pull out your models and just kind of see how they go. Um, that can be one actually negative of actually just drawing these things out, is that sometimes you lose your scale of how big the board is. Oh yeah, I could fit six units all the way across the board. And then you realize just how much that actually is and how much is actually affected by terrain. So there you go, uh, Martin, great question. And now we're on to number two, which is from uh, Terry Riss, and he's saying, what rules would you add, remove, change, clarify, if PP invited you to write Mark III? Um, I think first of all, I'd say, I don't want to see a Mark III, I like how this Mark II is, and if we want to make any changes, I'd do it through erratas, but what would I add, remove, change, or clarify? So I think one of the first ones I do is I want to see masters going back to three lists. I don't know if, I mean, rules, you're probably more talking about more specific ones, but I know for a organization standpoint, I would love to see something that's more, you know, back to the three lists as opposed to this ADR stuff. Uh, really just to kind of keep it different and keep it separate. I'd really love to see that. I'd also like to see a format that just does not allow tiers. I'm not against tiers, so to speak, but it'd be really interesting to see that difference about if you actually played a format, there's just like no tiers. Uh, I know there's what, the one format was called like Blood, Sweat, and Tears, where you have to play a tier, but just like some special one where you can't play tiers, and 
I don't know what, maybe some other thing with it too, but just something playing around with that idea. Because there are some casters that get really pigeonholed. You got like the Veil 2, and you got Bradigus. Guys like this, or girls, who are just kind of forced into this tier, and you're never seeing them outside. And it would just be interesting to play a format where they would have to try something different. So that would be nice too, but that's more like the organizational rules. Um, if it's rules of how things actually play, I think that something I would like to see change for sure would be the water rules, making the water rules a little bit more balanced between hordes and war machine. Uh, of course, you know, if a war jack gets knocked down in the water, it's like its boiler goes out and it doesn't do anything until somebody lights back up. And if a beast falls down in water, nothing happens whatsoever. So I really feel something needs to be done then there to try and balance these things out. Um, you know, I, I can understand the idea behind it with war jacks, but war jacks already have a little bit of an issue where they're usually being outclassed by beasts anyway. And now all of a sudden, if you have water, it's a really, really big deal. Um, I almost like the idea of like with this like deep water where like maybe all heavies would just go sinking down to the bottom because they're just too big. Uh, I don't know. Just something that'd be more balanced between the two. Uh, another rule that I love to see change as well is also the morale rule. This is a, a rule that I really like the idea of because morale definitely needs to be part of the game, but it's almost sometimes too random and too critical. Um, when you're attacking with any unit, you know, dice are just part of the game, right? Sometimes you get lucky, sometimes you get unlucky, but for the most part, it's not a huge deal. Um, probably the closest thing for just regular dice attacks is let's say you have your Nis Hunters, you're doing a massive combined shot, a big POW 20 to kill a caster, and you roll double ones to hit. And it's like, oh my god, what are the odds of that? Well, it's 1 in 36, but you know, this little tiny little bit, bit of bad luck changes everything, whereas a little bit of bad luck with one shot is no big deal. Now that's where it comes to morale, where you want morale to be important, but if you fail it, uh, especially when the unit is uh, uh, mainly there, let's say they just run some Doom Reavers into you, you have to take an Abomination chest or something like that, and it's like, bam, that unit uh, failed and it's doing nothing next turn and so not only is it not doing anything but it's getting in the way of other forces and that can be the game right there you know you're taking that test trying to get a nine or less or whatever it is and you should be fine but if you ever fail oh boy this is a massive massive thing so maybe some ways where that could be changed is that if you fail um you can still activate them as normal, but they have to either forfeit their movement or their action, something like that where you can still use them to an extent, but they still are affected, or maybe they would be plus, or like, it's not plus, minus two speed, minus two to hit, or something like that where it's a crippling effect, but not just you don't get them. It is over. Uh, yeah, big, big trouble. I mean, and sometimes too, I mean, you can run them back away first to make room for other stuff, but if they're engaged, yeah, go ahead. Take free strikes, right? Those all die. So uh, that one is definitely very, very crippling. Um, I'm trying to think of other rules that really, really bother me. Um, I guess <laughs> Terry is a as a Crix player, you know very well about uh, Excarnate and also the, the, the Bile Thrall Purge. The Purge kind of bugs me. Uh, just that auto hit and just that auto death, that seems to be too much. Um, but then again, this is something that people have been dealing with with forever, and uh, you know, Bile Thralls are easy to shoot down. So I'm sure there's a lot of things like that where if I think about it, it's like, man, this thing's just broken, but really it isn't. You know, is this something that annoys you? It doesn't really need to be fixed. Um, otherwise, I mean, one of the things you have to keep in mind is that Privateer Press is changing things. With the Lacerata, they changed up the Haley 2, they changed up the, the Denny 2, they improved some things like the, the Siege and Mantrax, whatever it's called. So they already are making changes. And I think with that Lacerata, we're not going to see a Mark III for a long time. If they're going to be doing a Mark III, they wouldn't have made that errata. And with the new like January errata coming up here, 
I would be holding on to see what's coming up because I would be expecting something pretty much the same magnitude as the last one and probably more going after hordes. Um, you know, the first big thing here was to Haley 2 and to Denny 2, but maybe now they're going to be pushing more into some of the, the other casters, right? Maybe Lilith 2 will be the, the next one hit by this. You never know. But either way, uh, Privateer Press is going in and they're fixing these things as they go and balancing these, these things out. So, uh, you know, I don't think we'll need a Mark 3, but just... Make sure, like at this time in this video, look forward to January because things could really change again. So there you go, Terry. I guess it's more kind of like a wish listing question more than a, uh, a tactical thing, but hopefully I, I gave you my thoughts there. Uh, last question here comes from Matthew Horton, and he says, why don't you like Krios 2? And it's kind of like, oh, well, okay. I don't like him for kind of two reasons. Um, the first reason why I don't like Krios 2 is because of bad memories. When I was first learning the game and the guy playing against me was doing Menoth and he loved Krios 2, um, what he would do is run his guys into me, pop feet, they automatically hit, and he would just wipe me out. And I was like, this is bull. How the hell am I supposed to deal with this? And then it turned out later that that was completely incorrect. You have to pop feet first, then they go up and they get an extra attack and auto hits and all these things. Uh, yeah, completely not played right, but there's still like that burning. Whenever I see Krios 2, it's like, ugh, you cheated me. You cheated me bad. And, you know, just off the... Off the bat there, Krios 2 will have me sit off there in a little bit. Now, Krios 2 as well, looking at, at it just from like an open look at the what the, the caster does, it's a little bit limited. Um, it's a very, very powerful effect. It's much like, say, like with Striker 3 or something like that where, wow, you know, with the melee punch, it is amazing. You're automatically hitting, you're getting an extra attack. Holy crow, you're just destroying things, but it has to be melee. And don't get me wrong, Menoth does have some very powerful melee units. However, they're also a little bit limited as there's a lot more in shooting. Uh, you have your exemplars and the, the errands and that's really it. There's not really a whole bunch of a lot of other things. You know, sure, I guess like paladins and stuff, but it's not like you have like overwhelmingly lots of melee guys who are fast and have reach. You know, what you would really want to take the advantage of the feet of this, uh, feet like this. Uh, see, a good example is someone like Siege. When Siege pops his feet and says, hey, whenever you attack anyone in this area, you know, the first time you damage them, you half their armor. Well, or you hit them. Uh, the big thing here is going to be that I can take lots of shooting. This bubble has been created, and I can take shooting to take advantage of every single enemy model that's in that zone. When I'm playing Krios, I have to move up, pop that feat, and then set up all these charge lanes, and it's really limiting what I can actually get in there. So again, very powerful effect, but very limited in what it can actually do. And at the end of the day, when you compare it to some of the other ones, like Krios 1, which is like, you're knocked down. And so this will be really good, like auto-hit and melee anyway, but it's also pretty much auto-hit with shooting, and has some other really great spells. It's just, ugh, Krios 2 always just seems to be lacking to me, and uh, just not really having it there. You know, you could try with the tier, and just taking a bajillion of the exemplars, and just trying to like swarm, 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 I'm going to be crushing you eventually. But it seems like if that was your play, why aren't you doing something like Doom Reaver spam instead, right? So, it, it just really isn't there for me. So, there it is. It's more of a personal thing, for the most part, like I said, where I just always feel like I was cheated by Krios 2, but at the end of the day... You look at Krios 2 and it's like, ah, but Krios 1. And uh, it just doesn't seem to, to give you everything you want. So there you go, guys. That's a War Machine 101. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. And again, if you want to be on here and submitting questions, get on that Mr. Malorian Facebook page. And uh, we'll talk to you later. Bye.